Welcome to our last live episode of season two of our Explore the Circular Economy show curated by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we discuss how to move away from a linear take, make waste economy to one that designs out waste and pollution, keeps products and materials in use and regenerates natural systems. Last week, we spoke with Stephanie Kelton about the role of modern monetary theory on shifting common misconceptions around government's deficits. But today we're here to talk about something really different. We're going to be talking about, talking about hidden resource flows in cities and how uh, photography and storytelling can complement quantitative data of infrastructures, livelihoods and resources in cities across the African continent. My name is Laura and I am part of the learning team here at the foundation, but I am not alone here today. I have with me Sarah O'Carroll, the Network Manager for the Institutions, Governments and Cities, and we're going to be talking to two very special guests. Yes, Lara, I'm really excited that we've got two speakers today from Italy, Africa, joining us from Cape Town in South Africa. So welcome to Solofina Nakesa, a professional officer with the Urban Systems team at Italy, Africa, and Paul Curry, the manager of the Urban Systems unit at Italy, Africa. Welcome. Welcome both. And Solo, we would like to start asking you to tell us a little bit more about Ecli Africa and the work you do around circular economy in cities. Um, thank you, uh, Sarah and Laura, for having us here today. And I think uh, for us as Ecli Africa, we are very much interested in seeing some of these uh, our networks develop in our work that we're doing with circular development. So we are a network-based organization, and uh, our base is local governments. We have a reach of over 1,750 local governments um, across the world. But particularly in Africa, what is special is that we have um, a reach of over 250 uh, local governments um, and then project cities um, on the continent. And our work is really to guide um, local governments on their journey to, to achieving sustainability. And we do this across um, five pathways. And this offer the framework uh, for which uh, we co-develop our integrated solutions uh, alongside uh, with, with, with our partners or with our project cities. So, um, so the pathways are uh, low emissions development, uh, nature-based development, circular development, um, resilient development, and importantly, equity and people-centered development. So the Urban Systems Unit, uh, we, we ex we're exploring a circularity at the moment but with a lens of people-centered and equity development. And I think uh, for us, that is, as, as you're trying to, to explore the different networks on the continent that are working with circularity, uh, such as the African uh, Circular Economy Network, and then also build uh, connections with, uh, with uh, for example, the African Circular Economy Alliance that is, has a wider reach on the continent. Um, I think we're really exploring the different platforms, the stakeholders, and also create a very unified platform for understanding um, circularity in African cities. Thank you. And Solo, um, what, what was the main reason to include circularity as part of these five pathways that you just mentioned? Um, thanks, Laura. And, and I think that's a very interesting uh, question. So cities are really especially African cities, we are transforming at a very fast rate. And uh, we want to take to go on a journey that does not repeat mistakes that have been made, but a very resource efficient journey that is able to address the needs, first of all, of the people, um, people's livelihoods, but then also uh, address issues of accessibility to resources. And then at the same time, address issues of efficiency and um, in the way we, we use resources, but then also address the needs of, of the people. So. I think circularity offers a, a key, a, a good edge in this, in being able to meet the needs, but in a systematic way that looks at the, at the infrastructure, that looks at the different uh, services that are to be met, but that we can meet in a sustainable and resource efficient way. So we thought this is a very, it's, it's, a, it's a key lens in which to look at this. And in addition to that, if we can look at it through um, 
people-centered and equitable development, I think uh, it's, it provides a wholesome framework um, to drive um, sustainable, sustainability and sustainable urban development. Thank you, Solo. And I think we will go back to this idea of systemic thinking um, throughout this whole episode. But now I would like to talk to Paul. Um, we call this episode Urban Intersections. And, and I think probably many people in the audience are just wondering, what is this? Sure, thanks, Lara. Um, the Urban Systems team uh, at Equity Africa is effectively charged with trying to draw the connections between so many different thematic areas. Uh, sustainable development is this wonderful broad umbrella uh, that allows many people to see their own objectives in it. Um, and I think uh, often we get focused on one specific element um, and this new era of thinking is really around uh, systems approaches. So urban intersections as a title is being very explicit about the fact that you cannot only talk about food, you cannot only talk about waste, you can't talk about water, infrastructure, settlements, equity without looking at them together. Uh, and so I think when we were conceptualizing with you some of the discussion for today, uh, drawing attention to how different resource systems and infrastructure systems and indeed the people who are both infrastructures and um, benefiting from the resources uh, intertwine. Um, it was quite an exciting idea to explore. Um, and then perhaps as a foreshadower of our conversation, uh, the interconnection between quantitative knowledge, which is often privileged, and qualitative and creative ways of knowing. And how do those intersect? Certainly, and when we talk about, uh, usually when we talk about quantitative data and the city, urban metabolism is spoken about as a framework to understand resource flows within a city. Um, but some people joining us today might not understand or have heard of the term urban metabolism before. Paul, could you maybe give us a brief description of what urban metabolism is? So urban metabolism, uh, one of my favorite concepts is, uh, describes how a city takes resources from the surrounding environment, which we know through globalization is the local environment, regional uh, trade flows and international trade flows, how it consumes, uh, digests and metabolizes these resources to produce economic production, um, ideally also social well-being uh, if the resources are, are well shared, uh, before it uh, releases these wastes um, and underutilized resources back into the local environment. And so urban metabolisms are effectively this process of concentrating resources, processing them uh, and dropping them in the local environment. And so with that imagery, for anyone familiar with circular economy, you're already thinking, well, how do we take that linear process and make it uh, more circular, more regenerative? Um, urban metabolism analyses uh, are ways to understand and measure uh, how a city metabolizes and moves resource flows uh, through itself. And there's a whole suite of really great uh, techniques and methodologies for doing this. Thanks, Paul. And well, today we want to explore some of these of these tools. Um, but I think in order for for our audience to understand a little bit better the context, um, when we talk about cities, especially in the in the context of well, in in different, we are going to be mentioning different case studies within the African continent, um, but. What are some of the main differences that you would um, highlight with, uh, for example, the European context? Paul, sorry. Well, I think as, as uh, Solo has mentioned uh, from the get-go, the biggest difference for us is the entry point for thinking about sustainability. While it may have emerged uh, to remark about environmental protection and the need for environmental protection, um, for African urban context, you have to start with uh, service delivery. You're living in, in cities where uh, many of the population don't have access to basic resources, where if you were to rely on quantitative systems, we look positively efficient. We're not emitting that much. We're not consuming that much, uh, but actually we are not uh, equally accessing the resources we need for a high quality of life. And so the challenge for sustainable development in African cities is how do you provide that quality of life in a way that um, this is equitable, but doesn't um, undermine the environment and ideally starts to regenerate the environment. As Solo has mentioned, we're growing incredibly fast. Um, some of the fastest uh, cities, growing cities in the world. How do we 
uh, ensure that we're regenerating the resources that we're reliant on. Um, so, I mean, many, to elaborate, many of the urban trends that we're seeing are the rapid population growth, but large informal settlements where people don't have access either to land tenure or basic services. We've got a very large youth population, uh, which poses many opportunities, but also challenges. Uh, we uh, have questions of, of ownership of the city or citizenship where people uh, are moving between uh, spaces um, looking for employment, uh, but maybe uh, are more true to a rural homeland where they send uh, remittances. So uh, those are some of the dynamics we're seeing in African cities that you have to take on. Yeah. And Solo, in the world that we live in today, data, quantitative data is often, often prized as um, the uh, kind of the, the hero for decision making. Um, and in Africa, we often have challenges around uh, the qu quality of quantitative data and in some cases just kind of a lack of quantitative data. Um, could you comment a little bit on this kind of reliance on quantitative data for decision making and the role of qualitative data in that? You're... Ah. Thank you, Sarah. And that's, that's, that's a very interesting, uh, that's a very interesting reflection because where there's no um, quantitative data, is there no information, you know? So does that mean that decisions won't be made because there's no um, quantitative data? So, and I think to us, our exploration is um, where there's no quantitative does not mean there's absence of data. So what are the different formats that we can capture data? And how can we extract data from, let's say, um, from photography, how can they um, extract data from videography to be able to make decisions or to be able to combine that with qualitative data to make um, this to inform decision making. So, and it's still a challenge, you know, uh, we, we are still at the level of exploration, but as, as, as it's been said, you know, pictures do speak a thousand words and it shouldn't just be for, for art, but then also for decision making, for um, for documenting what is happening in African cities or the reality of what is happening that qualitative data may not necessarily be able to collect. So um, quantitative is important, but it is not the only way of, um, of assessing what is happening or uh, assessing the different interactions that do happen in spaces, um, in different spaces within, within cities. You know, there's a lot of vibrancy that happens, be it in a market. Uh, you know, we can understand quantitatively the size of a market, but the dynamics of the different systems, be it uh, trade, uh, be it uh, mobility, you know, all that can be captured qualitatively to be able to make decisions that pertain to um, certain systems and how they interact with each other. Thank you, Solo. And in the beginning, in my, in my introduction, I mentioned photography and, and storytelling as two of the tools that we were going to discuss today. And we're going to be showing some images about the Hidden Flows uh, exhibition. But Paul, before we do this, could you explain to us a little bit more what this exhibition was about? So I think, you know, when, when diving in, it's, uh, it's a project which is about two and a bit years in, in uh, conceptualization. But the central idea is that if you are unable to measure certain infrastructures or certain resource flows, particularly those that are uh, decentralized, not moving through pipes um, uh, and moved by informal uh, people, uh, informal actors, and you can't measure them, what mainstream urban metabolism studies tell us is that they don't exist. Mm -hmm. And so this means we're reinforcing patterns of urban planning um, and decision-making which uh, naturally are exclusive through no sort of fault of the people who are practicing them. Uh, but because we can't count certain things, we are unable to, to uh, manage it. So the, that's the central problem of the exhibition, which it tries to address by saying, well, observation and the inbuilt knowledge of those living in the city is just as valid as uh, coming in with uh, statistics. And they offer different ways of knowing, different ways of appreciating the value that these um, resources and the people offer to the city. So the exhibition aimed to ask uh, people on Instagram, photographers, uh, to share what their city looks like, to share how they get 
water, energy, food, uh, where their waste goes, uh, how they move around the city. Uh, and so we could get this kind of crowdsourced collection of images. And then we also um, sought uh, photographers from uh, cities around the continent, uh, which ended up being Cairo, Kampala, uh, Bukavu in DRC, um, Ibadan and Cape Town to reflect on uh, some of the resource flows and, and what they mean. Um, and the idea is that if you can bring together this collection of imagery, uh, you can engage a conversation around it uh, and ideally draw out the key themes that policymakers already have sort of inbuilt and, and uh, in their minds. And you received, so, oh, sorry, Paul. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to mention just that you received over 600 uh, pictures. And if anyone is interested in seeing all of them, I recommend them to go to the website. We're going to be sharing the link uh, in the comments chat so everyone can see all of them. But I would like to bring uh, the first picture up for our audience. And in this photo, we have some boats and, and motor boats, and we are located uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, close to the city of Bukavu. And Paul, you selected this photo for our audience. What, what made you select this photo? So, so this image uh, is by Esten Sapu, um, and her story that she uh, put together was uh, around the centrality of these large and small boats uh, in connecting food uh, from around uh, the lake, uh, Lake Kivu, uh, to Bukavu, this, this town. And the remark is that it is faster to transport the food by boat than by the roads. And so uh, that's a bit of the context for the story. Why the picture is powerful to me is this sweeping sense from uh, lake to market to city behind it. And you can barely see the floor and it is full. And, and this connects very strongly with the sense of vibrance of, of African marketplaces, uh, but also of the importance and the reliance that many people have on these uh, flows of food uh, that come in. Um, you know, these are the ways, these are the supermarkets of many African cities. These are the ways that people get fresh produce um, and, and the ways that many people make uh, a living. So there's something vibrant and powerful about the image, which, which speaks to me. Um, I certainly, from, from looking at this image, I think it's also um, useful to note that the, the boats are transporting both food to the market as well as people across the lake and, it, and in between. And I think in terms of the circular economy, we often think of logistics just for either kind of products and goods or in terms of people. And here in the African context, you can see that there's this um, reliance on the same form of transport, um, the same boat for both people and goods. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think the kind of emergent nature of how resources move, you know, where there's an opportunity and it speaks to an adaptability of many informal systems and the informal economy to, uh, to fill gaps, to uh, address needs uh, faster. And there the are many people, you know, some who are not interested in definitions, uh, but who are, who are trying to suggest for decision making that we reframe this word informal. It is the majority economy. And the response to formalize might not really appreciate what's what's going on. Um, so, you know, the people who, who are saying, well, it's makeshift economies, but also why is this different from the archetype of the man wearing a suit carrying a briefcase? Uh, why are we differentiating when in fact informal actors are private sector actors? They've sunk their personal equity uh, and labor into their enterprises. Mm -hmm. So if cities can take that mindset, um, it, it can appreciate, I think, some of the value uh, offered. I, I personally really like, Paul, um, what you say about using the word private actors uh, versus informal actors. And, and I think it, it really changes the way you look at things, uh, especially from, from a European uh, perspective or background. I think it, it, we really need to start working harder on, on making sure that we are using the right words in, in order to be able to see the, the huge uh, potential and impact of things happening in other places around the world. So thank you, Esther Nasapu, for this picture. I think it's time to move to our second image, Sarah. So, um, Solo, I believe that you picked um, this image for us. Um, and it's a wonderful image of a major bus terminal um, in Ghana. 
Um, and you can see that uh, what we might typically call a bus in, in Europe is certainly not the bus that is in this picture. Here we have minibus taxis, um, as they're called. Um, and all of these umbrellas around the minibus taxis are an, a, a marketplace. Um, and so it's a wonderful image that shows kind of how closely trade and mobility um, are um, in this place. Um, and just kind of the, the volume of minibus taxis and umbrellas. So all of these different little shops um, that are operating um, in this place. Um, Sola, why did you choose this image for us? And, and you begin to even touch upon um, some, of the some of the issues in that image that I think really do speak strongly. It's, so the image really does speak of multiple systems, you know? And to me, that is a hub. You know, it's, it is a transportation hub, but then at the same time, it is a commerce, retail, and marketing hub. So, and what you see is that the retail that happens around the transportation is really heavily reliant on the volumes of people that move uh, towards the transport. So, though, of course, in such a system, what you don't see sometimes is, let's say, what happens on a rainy day, you know, what does the sanitation look like? What does the water systems look like? But then what you get to appreciate is that in terms of accessibility, you know, it offers a lot of variety of options for the city dwellers that use the transportation hub to access their basic needs. But then also in terms of flexibility, you know, it offers um, a lot of options for traders to be able to, to set up and go uh, as quickly as possible, you know, whenever the need uh, demands or whenever income or whenever different opportunities arise or even flexibility in terms of the way they are setting up their stalls as close as possible to the to the to their market or the way they are setting up their stall structure you know to match to match to match their needs or to match what they are able to, to 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 afford though sometimes you see that in when it's times to up to upgrade or to formalize like Paul uh, talked about earlier all these systems are not paid attention to so in, in formalizing, they'll set up a shopping mall, but then this shopping mall is not cognizant of the fact that you have to address issues of accessibility, who can afford to rent in that shopping mall, or how close are um, the different people to their market. So to me, it shows a reality, but then in terms of planning, you know, that is where sometimes the clash dust comes in. So um, we find that sometimes planning excludes what was already on the site. You know, yet there are already systems that on the site that have self-organized to to deliver the needs or to deliver the, the requirements of the people, but then also the site. Yeah, and I think on that point, um, just reflecting again on the image, for me, what, what's highlighted as well is just the volume. So the number of people that are transported in a minibus taxi as opposed to a double-decker bus. Um, and the volume of goods that can be sold underneath an umbrella or a gazebo compared to the number of goods that can be sold in an 80 square meter shop, for example. Um, and it's something I think uh, that we really need to think about when, as you say, when we're thinking about planning and decision making um, for these spaces, but also in terms of the circular economy, thinking about the solutions. So we're not talking about big volumes, um, you know, all together that um, all these little shops um, might have a significant volume, but individually, um, you know, it's it's much smaller volumes compared to to what yeah what we might think of in a in a Western world context. No, absolutely, and I think importantly, it's also the issue of accessibility in different ways. You know, um, you know, these are very uh, small units, but then in terms of access, access to the entrepreneurs, but then access to the people using such spaces. To me, that is really also. A, the edge where we bring in the issue of uh, people-centered um, development that is aware of what people can afford or what people can provide mm -hmm. by their own means and how to support this. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Solo. And Sarah, we have time for one more photo that uh, you selected from Katum Babadru. And in this photo, we can see a lot of green plastic bottles. Why did you choose this photo? I love this photo because I think we often see images of waste dumps in Africa, which um, we kind of interpret as, uh, you know, big, big sources of, of resources. Mm -hmm. um, but I love this picture because 
um, it shows a different kind of abundance of resources in Africa, where usually we might think of Africa being abundant in terms of metals and minerals related to kind of extractive industries. Like I thought that this is such a wonderful photo to show the abundance of a particular resource um, in, yeah, in a photo format that we would usually see kind of a very different uh, image of probably, you know, open burning on the landfill, probably people working there in very unsafe conditions and, and possibly living there as well. Um, and so I thought this image was a lovely contrast to the images that we usually see of waste dumps in Africa. Yep. Um, I think, well, we should, uh, I wanted to ask Paul, because we said photography and storytelling, but we haven't really mentioned the storytelling, ob ob although obviously all these uh, photographs tell a very, a very big uh, story. How did you use the storytelling within this project? Thanks for that. And, and I think here, you know, we want to invite the um, viewers to, to visit the exhibition and explore uh, each of the photos has an embedded uh, story or idea. Um, and uh, certainly the five from the different cities tell each tell a story uh, through the lens of resources and, and people. But in our practice with ICLE Africa, we do a lot of visioning workshops with local government uh, and with uh, stakeholders. And the power of people being able to see themselves in their current city or in future cities uh, is wonderful to see. And, and when you have a successful kind of visioning or futuring workshop, uh, you can see people uh, get excited about the specific actions they can take now to uh, shape more sustainable cities. And just as a tip from us, what's important is, is for people to place themselves personally. And what I love about the pictures is that they're full of people. If, if you mentioned a, an exhibition on resources, I think most people would, would picture stuff, material, mining, uh, extraction and every one of the pictures in this exhibition has people as the center and I think that's really telling for the types of landscapes and cities we have in Africa. Um, and similarly with storytelling, if you ask someone to describe their city in 2040, you will hear about what it looks like and the infrastructure, the pipes, the way things move. But if you ask them to say, well, how old will you be in 2040? Uh, do you have children or niece or nephew? How old will they be? And describe their day then you get these very rich tellings of interactions uh, and intersections in the city. Uh, I know we're running to the end, so I just need to say a very important acknowledgement to the whole process of this, which is uh, to acknowledge our partners uh, at Stellenbosch University and the Center for Complex Systems in Transition, uh, as well as uh, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, um, and this piece of work, which was really entrusted to us to deliver uh, in an interesting way, uh, was funded by the Leading Integrated Research uh, in Africa 2030 uh, grant. So those are my acknowledgements before we pause. Thanks, Paul. Um, Solo, maybe you could help us answer a question that's come through um, from the audience from Linus on LinkedIn. Um, thanks, the, this exhibition as a conversation starter is really, really great. Um, and so very kind of complimentary um, to that, well done. Um, but is interested to understand buy-in from local government around using photographs like this um, for policy dialogues and for policy making. Um, and so maybe you can answer that question in relation to like what next after, after the exhibition um, and if policy dialogues is, is part of this process. Um, thank you, Sarah. And I'd like to just say that this is very much an exploratory process, you know, but then exploratory in a way that it's touching on the pertinent issues happening. So in conversations with local governments, maybe it's also a challenge to us to, to start shifting conversations about what they don't have, but then sort of starting with what is present or what is currently happening and this can be backed visually and then from there we kind of start making the start making the steps towards uh, how to work with uh, let's say qualitative methods or other forms of quantitative to be able to to make very informed decisions so to us it's a uh, it's it's very exploratory even in our engagements with our partners or with our different cities but to me it is a conversation starter because it talks about what is present and what can be seen and related to as Paul, uh, as Paul mentioned. Thank you. 
if I may add briefly, it, this is the beginning of a process um, and it's emergent, it's exciting. We need both quantitative information, uh, but also to challenge uh, our local government uh, officers uh, with what the data is telling them and say, well, does this represent what these images share? So this is the beginning of a series of uh, policy dialogues, as Hilo has mentioned. Um, so uh, we hope you'll stay tuned and, and possibly join them, given many of them will have to be virtual. I have one final question uh, from the audience from Siraj on LinkedIn, because this is, I think, something that we, we usually ask in, in a lot of the conversations we have with Latin America or with, with the speakers uh, from, from Africa. And it's how do we enable African cities to leapfrog the more developed cities that are hampered with historic infrastructure? And I would like to hear your thoughts on this idea of leapfrogging. Who's keen? So, do you want to take this one? <laughs> Paul, <laughs> right back at you. So, so leapfrogging is, is, I mean, it's the classic term when, when speaking about the opportunity uh, that we face in our cities. And, um, you know, it, it, it's a value-laden term in many respects. Um, we have the opportunity to learn from what other uh, countries, cities have done. Um, and to benefit from technology that's been trialed elsewhere. Um, and I think getting people on board with the doing of the leapfrogging can be very difficult because a lot of the technologies that we're promoting are decentralized. Uh, they may not look as pretty. They may not have the same aspirational quality as the networked infrastructures that we're used to. And so uh, our challenge is how do we mainstream these without them, for example, being experimented on in, in informal spaces or experimenting on poor um, with this, for example, you know, a fantastic uh, composting toilet. How do we get the composting toilet to work in a way that's actually appealing uh, to the aspirations of people living in a space who want centralized infrastructure? And so I think we as development practitioners owe it to uh, our cities to ensure that quality of life is thought of when we talk about leapfrogging. So a lot of potential, but it has to be done um, in a appropriate manners. I think that's a great answer. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> thanks, Paul. Thanks, Solo, for, for being here with us today. And thanks, Sarah, for co-hosting this episode with me. I would like to thank you at home uh, for watching. As I said in the beginning, this was our last live episode of season two of the Explore the Circular Economy show. But this is not the end. Next week, we will be publishing on our website, on, on our YouTube channel, the full conversation we had with Kate Rayworth, the author of Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, um, that we had a few, a few weeks ago. So you, it will be available to watch it. And of course, we are in the middle of preparing a lot more seasons to come in 2021. So stay tuned for February next year. I would like to thank all of you for following us throughout the whole season and for sending us all your questions and comments. And remember that you can catch up on any episodes that you may have missed on, on both our websites and our, on our YouTube channel. And we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Thank <laughs> you.